All right, everybody. Good morning and welcome to another Friday, another episode of C-Mask. I'm here with this based panel of Catholic gentlemen, uh, Tim Gordon, Will Nolan, and Nick Stumphauser. How are you guys doing this morning? Pretty well. Feeling fresh and froggy. Hungry. Hungry, hungry. In, in several ways. <laughs> in every imaginable way. <laughs> Nick's looking Vicious. especially fresh. You look like uh, Tom Selleck if you were to have a like a dirty blonde uh, stepson poured it straight out of the 70s if he Looking. if he bleached his mustache <laughs> <laughs> there's 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 something above your lip there i can see it you said it was a, a suggestion a suggestion indeed all right You're looking so. like tom Selleck if he had a great great grandson at this point. <laughs> oh already off the rails is good so today uh we're talking about mental health so no pro i want to approach this from a couple different angles the first one is we see this rise of you know mental health diagnosis um, whether it's self-diagnosis in the case of you know uh, me and tim with the hypochondria that's a maybe a story for later later on in the episode uh diagnosis through secular therapists you know this um increasing popularity of uh these these prescription drugs ssris benzodiazepines etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'd love to you know talk about what your guys' thoughts on this being potentially some kind of like demonic oppression, diabolical in nature, and how much of this is actually actually genuine or just sort of symptomatic of the culture that we live in. And the other piece of that is how have we personally encountered these particular stressors, anxiety, depression, panic, et cetera, and what has allowed us to, you know, uh, keep these under control through, you know, obviously our faith, uh, our, our spiritual walks with Christ, being Catholics, and, you know, some of the other things, activity, et cetera. That has allowed uh, us to, like I said, keep these things under control. So to start this off, kind of just like how I said in the beginning there, what are your thoughts on the current landscape of mental health and the widespread diagnosis of anxiety, depression, et cetera? To me, this seems like kind of a byproduct of the hyper fixation on the self. Some of it seems quite almost narcissistic in nature because there is this hyper focus on the individual symptomatic of sort of individualism so i'd like to hear your guys' thoughts on uh um, why this is so popular now so there was a, a cambridge economist called clive hamilton who wrote a paper by the name of the disappointment of liberalism and one of the things he pointed out in that paper is that since world war ii real incomes have increased by around four to five times people have never been wealthier in real terms than they are right now in human history. Yet depression has gone up in that same time period since World War II by about 10 times. So you're wealthier, but you're more depressed. And depression is the leading cause of disability in the world right now. It's responsible for more missed work days than anything else. Just people who feel so crushingly depressed, they can't get themselves out of the house to get to work. So it's super interesting that the wealth and the mental health relate together like that. You're wealthier, but your mental health is worse. And I think this is because there's a real basic misconception at the grassroots level of modern psychology because their vision of what a human being is is fundamentally wrong. So I want to suggest, this is my crazy thought for the day, that the only truly mentally healthy people are saints. Like that's what real mental health involves. Mm -hmm. And it means embracing suffering and accepting that the fall of man. So original sin means that we're disordered in all kinds of ways. And the expectation of happiness should not be the default. That's why we're told that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. It's hard work to actually yeah. bring things back into order. And a lot of your life is going to be about the endurance of that and the suffering it entails. That's why St. Thomas says that, it's a well-adjusted mind that has that measure of sadness. Excessive mirth is actually worse than excessive sadness. So that's where I'm coming at today's episode from. Sorry, that was long. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's the I coolest think, mental health take I've ever heard. Yeah. Just it was it good, really good. And mm -hmm. it's especially on point, Will, for guys like Mike and me that go in and out of hypochondria because... <clears throat> the christening of the Heideggerian moment of authenticity when one confronts one's own death 
is the pinnacle of mental health that you're attributing to the saints. So like Nick and I talked about this a lot in April. I had this bad month of April, worst month I've had in seven or eight years of hypochondria. And, or, I mean, bar none, I've, I've had a really easy seven or eight years, relatively speaking, I had some bad stuff happen then got fired, had Patreon accounts canceled. None of it really stressed me out. Um, had, had, had a solid seven years, let's say, but in April we were talking about, um, the fact that for a hypochondriac and, and Kierkegaard says in the concept of anxiety, that all anxiety is just unresolved um, death confrontation. Even people that don't like to go to sleep until late, which is me and some of my, my, my I know one or two of my brothers and, and my friends who tend to be hypochondriacs. It's unresolved death confrontation. You don't like, you don't like the light to end. Well, I lost what I was going to say. Oh yeah. Um, that, so that's especially relevant to what you said about like the saints are the ones that are willing to give it up. And and Nick, I remember was standing out by my basketball hoop talking about this. Like it's, it's the paradox of life. You know, philosophy is training for death. Christian philosophy is training for death. And you have to be willing to give it all up to have to scoop your life back. Like Abraham with Isaac, you know, gotta, gotta be willing to give it away at a moment's notice in order to, truly have a christian life we all you know live this borrowed platonic existence in god's true act it's to really embrace your your even your your physical life this side of the eschaton you have to be willing to give it up at a moment's notice and that that is a cause of anxiety the other thing i was going to say that i wanted to ask you guys without shifting track is i don't know if the mental health professionals you've ever dealt with said that there's uh, always anxiety, depression loops that are like mutually constitutive. They always told me that and that always sounded like bullshit because I'm, I've never struggled with depression in my entire life. Just, just anxiety. I'll get in my reptile brain and, and, and get and ride, but I never get depressed. And also then when they try to diagnose you with the benzos, I, I, I was going through a file folder the other day and I have like a bunch of uncashed in benzo diagnoses and I'm like, I'm going to burn these. I never have done drugs. I'm never going to do drugs. It's the same drug for anxiety and depression. In other words, metabolic hyperactivity and hypoactivity. You're being diagnosed with the exact same shit. That doesn't make sense at all. So, I mean, I, I can do math. That doesn't make sense, bro. Um, I don't know what with this three three kind of quick thoughts in response to well um i'll just th throw my foundational statement out there and then we can build off of what tim said if, if you want but um i checked this a while ago and i think the number was lower and in fact this is suggesting that covid increased it a lot but Will's looking for a book. He's hunting for a book. Oh yeah, you know <laughs> I can see it. I can <laughs> see it. <laughs> I can't see it. I, I know the one I need. What I want though, I'll find it in a minute. Um, COVID increased this a lot, but uh, one in five Americans are currently taking a prescription for mental health of some kind. So some kind of pharmaceutical mind-altering substance for mental health. It's about 65 million Americans. That's so, so, so many. Um, I think one in 10 is an SSRI. So specifically like an antidepressant. Or that's the class is an antidepressant. But as Tim said, like they off-label antidepressants for everything. They off-label antidepressants for um, uh, GI stuff. Uh, yeah. What's that called? I'm... I'm idiopathic whatever what am i thinking of tim are not crohn's you thinking just the, um, the just the general cyclamine no no just the generalized if your tummy hurts a lot and they can't figure out why they call it oh the gi uh the gi what it doesn't what matter it, the, yeah it doesn't matter yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i just i couldn't remember it for some reason solvent um, or something i forget what it is yeah, but uh, I remember when I was when I was eighteen, I was uh, depressed as every eighteen year old gets at some point. But it it was pretty rough, and um, I kind of bullied my mom into letting me go see a the same 
neurologist who actually diagnosed me with Tourette's when I was eight years old. The guy was like a thousand years old. I was like, I'm sad. Give me drugs. And when I was 18, uh, I didn't have the same perspective on health and, and nutrition and big pharma and so on. Mm. And, you know, my poor mother was, was trying to get me to do anything else besides take pharmaceuticals. And I was, I was, I was being very difficult and informing her how little she knew about the study of pharmacology and that these, these scientists with their fancy papers knew much more than, than she did. And, um, they put me on Lexapro and four weeks later I wrote a suicide note and then they put me on Prozac. And about four weeks after that, I, something clicked, praise, praise the Lord, something clicked. And I was like, you know, I don't think, I don't think these pills are right for me. And, uh, I stopped taking them cold Turkey, which you're not supposed to do. And, you know, got one of those, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever had this, well, Tim, you've never taken psych drugs, but you're not supposed to stop them abruptly because you'll get like these really horrifying feelings of electrocution that like run yep. up your spine. You felt that Mike? Oh yeah. I've had brain zaps hardcore coming off. I can't remember which one it was acetylopram yeah. or some, something along those lines, but yeah, there's significant, like there was like short circuiting happening in your brain or whatever was going on. Definitely. Yeah, it feels like you shut the fork in a light socket. Yeah. Luckily it only happened once, but uh, it was very scary. Um, you know, and, and I got off those and, have since i think have a much better apprehension of of uh the whole landscape of mental health and and well-being but yeah i'll just i'm just putting that out there as sort of the foundation for this episode of like yeah i've been i've been as low as i thought i could get and i've tried the drugs and the drugs are bullshit and anyone who's actually on the drugs and has ever gotten off will tell you the exact same thing that it's not whatever pharma is offering you is almost certainly not the answer at least today yeah, there's some decent <clears throat> studies on the fact that just lifting weights does more for depression in men than pills do. So I always tell guys who are struggling with mental health, how much exercise are you doing? Start mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. Like be regular also, with your exercise routine. Magnesium has outperformed SSRIs. Aspirin has outperformed SSRIs. Doing nothing has outperformed SSRIs. <laughs> Going for walks has out. Like the meta analysis on SSRIs is so bad. <laughs> yep. I was actually looking into this before um, we, we got on this talk. Will, you're going to say something. Go ahead. No, no, it's not important. I, I found that book I was looking for. I'd recommend people have a look at it. Let me see if I can hold it up. The Triumph of the Thera Therapeutic Uses of Faith After Freud by Philip Reef. And it, here's a line from it. He says that religious man was born to be saved. Psychological man is born to be pleased. And he talks about this mm. paradigm shift and how we think wow. about mental health. And it's so important, especially once you understand that no one is going to save you apart from Christ in the, the Christian view of things. And he's not going to do that for you without the cross, his, but also your own too. Like if he got to heaven through the cross, you think you're getting there without that? That's crazy. So inbuilt for the religious view is this idea that suffering has a purpose and you shouldn't try to escape it. Jesus will save you, but he won't take the suffering away from you. He'll just use it to actually purify you. So that's what we're committed to, understanding that suffering has a role. And I like looking at the last sentence of books. Listen to this. That a sense of well-being has become the end rather than a byproduct of striving after some superior communal end, announces a fundamental change of focus in the entire cast of our culture toward a human condition about which there will be nothing further to say in terms of the old style of despair and hope. So making well-being the end of life in terms of that feel-good, self-help meaning of the word, that's a big mistake. Yeah, it's embracing it's embracing the suffering of life and the carrying of that cross and the peace that comes with it and complete mm -hmm. submission to God's will that has brought about peace, you know, that has transcended all understanding for me. You just lay it at the foot of the cross and there's almost like a there's a relief in knowing you don't even have to shoulder it on your own, but you you know that inbuilt to the Christian life is suffering. You can't and you can't circumvent that. Now, with the SSRIs and the benzodiazepine distinction, just like Nick, I, I've had ex extensive experience on both. 
And what's really interesting about all the studies about serotonin or the SSRIs, serotonin select, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, is that uh, there's actually no positive outcome versus people that don't take them at all. So you really start to wonder what is actually going on on like a biochemical level in your brain. And yeah. so uh, much like you, Nick, I've experienced this suicidal ideation that comes from them. And at best, so at worst, it's suicidal ideation. At best, it's a a, a cold indifference. Yeah. It's called anhedonia. That's the, the technical term because serotonin has been marketed as the happy hormone because after the patents on the first generation antidepressants, which were uh, MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which increased dopamine, when those patents ran out, pharma had to scramble together and find some other mechanism of action for antidepressants. And they went with SNRIs and SSRIs, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors and serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And when you increase serotonin in everything from mice to apes to humans, you get what's known as anhedonia, which is the inability to experience pleasure. And so if you've essentially cauterized the nerves of the human person, yeah, they're not going to be depressed anymore, but they're also not going to feel joy or happiness or pleasure. And that is seen as success if somebody's, you know, in a, a really rough spot. And the irony is there are some individuals who actually do experience the benefits from SSRIs. And the benefits appear to be the same benefits that are conferred from smoking marijuana, which is that there is an inflammatory process that happens in the brain that increases the brain's defense mechanism in uh, the increase of a substance called allopregnenolone, which is a, a neurosteroid that uh, mothers postpartum, it drops very heavily, which is what confers postpartum depression. And, and prior to that, progesterone increases allopregnenolone in the brain, which is why pregnant mothers are, are often euphoric if they're not you know growing up in the mornings, but in general, they're, they're, they're more euphoric and happy. And so SSRIs and marijuana both inflame the brain, and as a response, allopregnenolone goes up. And so basically any benefits that are being conferred from SSRIs is incidental. It's, 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 it's an accident. And, <laughs> and in general, the vast majority of people uh, experience anhedonia. There's this idea Nick, of... you... Go ahead, Tim. Sorry, I was just going to ask a quick yes, no. Do you know if uh, SSRIs block the production, the natural production of dopamine the way that marijuana use does? Uh, by definition, it has to because SSRI, uh, serotonin and dopamine exist in a seesaw. So as dopamine goes up, it naturally suppresses serotonin and vice versa. So if you are preventing the reuptake of serotonin, that means that the uh, the circulating serotonin concentration increases and so therefore the circulating dopamine concentration would decrease as a result of that very interesting it's and this is where this popular thought of oh it's just a chemical imbalance comes to be even like my grandparents are like oh yeah it's a, it's a chemical imbalance you're like well what's the imbalance between which chemicals the only imbalance that exists is in, is in a person's life between the things that they should be doing and the things that they should not be doing and quite often the people that are uh, seeking out these SSRIs, benzodiazepines, et cetera, aren't sleeping well. Uh, eat, they eat like shit. They don't move. Uh, they don't, they're, well, they're usually not people of faith. And so they're looking for this very passive means of solving these issues that are way deeper than just simply a pill can solve. And benzodiazepines in particular are very, very dangerous oh. uh, a, uh, drug. I don't know if you guys had have had any experience. I've been prescribed pretty much all of them you know, Xanax, um, you know, uh, clonazepam, yeah, you name it. Um, Ativan, I believe, is one of them as well. And it's crazy what happens because there is a high that mm -hmm. you experience from them, but the low is so crushing that it just, it facilitates just a drug addiction. That's all it yeah. is. So incredibly effective. It's just like getting drunk, like getting hammered. Yeah, your anxiety is crushed. But what happens is this rebound the very next day. Very, very, very dangerous. And uh, dependency on this drug happens within like a week of taking it daily at a certain yeah. dose. And yeah. it's so amazing how willy-nilly a lot of therapists, a lot of doctors are willing to prescribe said drugs because, um, I mean, it's incredibly dangerous stuff. You could die from the withdrawal of, of benzodiazepines, as you know. Yeah, and you, they're trying to give this shit away. Like, I went yeah. to 
it, when, yeah, when, when Abby was really young and I was trying anything aside from actually doing the drugs that they were prescribing, uh, I would go, I'm like, I'll even try going and talking to a psychotherapist. I wasn't bullying anyone to let me go. I was so stressed out after we came back into the country and I was in law school. I had all these compounding stressors, but mainly it was just um, surgery after surgery of Abby follow-up surgeries and um they're just trying to give it away you go in um to the doctor to urgent care and you're like yeah don't don't worry about that white coat hypertension you know i my my, my blood pressure is going to be really high but i i have that and you're just trying to get to see the doctor and you're talking to the nurse the first thing the doctor will say hey i'm a hypochondriac don't worry about it the doctor will come in and they're like so anxiety disorder you're like I guess if if I had like an IQ 104 and was a, a determinist, materialist, reductionist, uh, nincompoop like you. Yeah, that's what I would. That's what I would call it. <laughs> and then they're like, OK, well, before we do anything, I'm going to write you a prescription for <laughs> one of the Benzo family. And you're like, OK, I'm not going to use it. But then you're like, OK, so I had a tickle in my throat. I just want to make sure it's not like throat cancer. And then, and then you're like, OK, it's strep throat. It's harder to get them to prescribe you an antibiotic, which, you know, if they're willy nilly with the writing of antibiotic prescriptions, who cares? But they're like, I guess I'll give this to you. You're trying to take it out of their hand. Yeah. They're like, take the benzo. And they're like trying to force feed you these pills that forms this ridiculously sharp contrast of their enthusiasms for prescription. So that's one thing I, I wanted to ask Will. Are you familiar with the, the so-called three ages of the ancient Greeks? Well, in in reference to your your book, you know, you have the Homeric age. Oh yeah, your violence with with just a little bit of a little bit of natural law you get prefigured in Hom Homer and Hesiod, um, and then the tragic Greeks, very very cool, overlooked, interesting age. You know the the area of the, the era of the tragedians five six hundred BC, and then of course you have the the they call it the Platonic Age, the philosophic Athenian Enlightenment. I call it the Aristotelian Age, which they say killed the Tragic Age. These three Greek eras, um, if you talk to any serious Catholic scholar of philosophy, says basically this is the Holy Spirit readying the way for, for Christ so that you know the Greeks readied the way for Christ so that the world could understand because the Greeks culminated with Aristotle we haven't really ever gotten past Aristotle aside from a little bit of systematization by, by Aquinas. So, so this era of Christ ushers in the, um, the concept of the salvific man or the man, you know, soteriological man, whatever, whatever your book stated, the domestication of the, the man in need of salvation is what you mentioned, the domestication of the gospel, the domestication of the West, the, desacralization of the West is therapeutic man where he just wants to be pleased. Yeah. But I, I, I can't help but remark that even in that second Greek phase, I don't know about the Homeric Greeks. I'll have to think about it, but even in that second Greek phase, which is pre-Christian pre-soteriological whereupon, you know, amor fati is the anthem, you know, lo love fate, no matter what happens, Oedipus Rex can't see until he's blinded himself. You know, you, your story's going to end up bad. No one gets out alive, which is, of course, true without salvation in this context. And um, any of the, the the remaining tragedians, whether you're talking Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus, you get you do get the vision. You do get the truth. You just have to be willing to say amor fati, love fate, no matter what happens. This is so much more based than of course play aristotle really is just waiting for baptism he, he gets everything ready for jesus but this is so much more based than where we are now therapeutic man where people just want to be pleased all the time they're like just give me drugs give me video games give me ai give me fantasy worlds um and, and of course the the truth is between the aristotelian and and christian view it's just it's all about Aristotelian natural virtue in this life, uh, sacralized by by Christ's blood, the sprinkling of Christ's blood and, and the sacraments. And um, we're, we're just waiting to be saved by Jesus and to, to cooperate with it with good deeds. But if you have to pick, 
between the book ending eras, you know, tragic. I, I had a philosophy professor, Charles Bombach, who would always say this. He's a lapsed Catholic. He's like, the tragic is so much more based than the therapeutic. And he was always shitting on therapy, modern psych therapy, because it's all based around avoiding the confrontation with death, avoiding suffering, avoiding the the sight that Oedipus gets after blinding himself. Whereas it's the exact opposite with the with the tragic worldview. So I, I just can't I if you have to pick one, young men, I guess go with the tragic point of view, but but um why not have all of the goodies of the tragic point of view, the embracing of your death, your suffering with the resurrection of Christ, and then all of a sudden it's it's the most based. Yeah. This is what attracted me to Nietzsche when I was late teens, early twenties, because at least he emphasizes the importance of hardship and embracing suffering. Like I'd rather have that than someone trying to sugarcoat everything. And that's an insight that you get deepened in the lives of the saints as well. And people need to read those more because they are always talking about the importance of basically accepting a, a real um, hell on earth in preference to a false paradise. Like you want a real hell over a false heaven. Because the suffering is what's actually going to bring you closer to reality and result in humility. If you run from that and try to shield yourself from being exposed and actually rendered naked before reality, that's a far worse position for you to be in spiritually. Absolutely. I have a question to build on what you both just said. I don't think that any man, okay, that's not true. Plenty of men would shy away from this, but but men with any practice of virtue whatsoever, when presented with rational suffering, like a true crisis, are willing to take it on. They're willing to shoulder it. If they've done like really just any maturation in their life whatsoever, the loss of a job, the death of a loved one, you name it, a sickness, a lawsuit they'll t they'll they'll shoulder it but i think the main conundrum with mental health that we see in modernity and and normie world that makes me and i i know mike and tim very uncomfortable as well is it's the irrational suffering and this is like what hypochondria is now i i have ocd I hate saying that. It sounds so gay to be like, I have, I have a thing. Hi, my name's Nick and I have a thing, you know, but if you were to psychologize it and wear some gold rimmed circular glasses and say, you know, what, what category of pathology do I most struggle with? It would be OCD and hypochondria is a subset of that. So is scrupulosity. When I was eight years old, I was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. I had a lot of physical tics. And then when I was 19, I was diagnosed with narcolepsy. Come to find out OCD, narcolepsy, and Tourette's all exist in the same part. The same part of the brain is injured. The caudite nucleus and the orbital cortex are all injured. Uh, an injury to their causes all three of those things. And if you have one, it's very likely you'll have two. And if you have two, it's very likely you have all three. And I ended up having all three. Um, and it also, just as, as a side fact, in 2011, the pandemics flu vaccine in Norway found an 800% increase in narcolepsy cases. The last vaccine I got was in 2012. It was a flu vaccine. So it's very possible that a lot of these things are like actual physical injuries to the brain, uh, whether in childhood or, or later in adult life. Um, but anyway, back to my original point, which is what, what I think men really struggle with is the feeling of emasculation that comes from the irrational. Yeah. You know, Tim, I just was on the phone yesterday with Tim. Like it, it's this, it's, and maybe this is where the diabolic comes in. Maybe this is where the alchemical and the brain comes in. I don't know, but there's something there that just completely sets you off and you can't pin it down. And the longer you look at it, the less sense it makes, but it's the scariest thing. And you start behaving irrationally and then you, you don't feel 
masculine as a result of this. And I think that's really where the mental health question starts to come into play because it's like, yeah, if any good Christian man, if you present him with suffering, they'll be like, okay, let's do this. Yeah. And nobody's really going to fault you. Nobody's really going to look down on you. Like, Oh, Tim, why are you stressed? Oh, your, your daughter's getting half of her brain removed. My goodness gracious. What can I do for you? You're such a strong man. Even if you were like a sniveling heap on the ground, everyone would be like, what a strong man that is. But the moment you're like, well, I think I have cancer. And they're like, well, do you? And you're like, no. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second. I thought you were like a Chad. You know, what's going on? So how do we deal with the irrational is, is my question. So the, the Stoics have some truth here, I think. They get a lot wrong in that their ideal, and not a lot of people know this, is actually just to basically ignore all emotion and see the whole of it as bad. What they say is that play it out. What's the worst thing could happen? Set that out on paper if you need to. If you're up late at night and can't sleep, write down what the worst thing that can possibly happen is. And you have to face that all the way through and remind yourself of it again and again so that there's no boogeyman at the back of your mind. And once you can make peace with what that worst possible outcome could be in principle and just accept that maybe that is what Providence has in store for you and there's some good reason for it, then you can put the anxiety to one side. But most of what you're talking about there, Tim, means that um, Nick, sorry, and Tim with the same um, like mental process, it's like a vortex that just opens up, you get sucked into it, and you get whirled around continually. And 99.999% of the stuff you worry about never even happens. Yeah. yeah. So it paralyzes you. Yeah. Rem remember, Caesar was like better to, better to die once than a thousand times. You know, when he, I think it's in um, Shakespeare's Tragedy of Caesar. Like better to die once than a thousand times. Like, why are you going into work today? It's the Ides of March. And he's like, I'm not going to worry about it. If it does, maybe he should have on March 15th. But, <laughs> you know, some days you stay home from work, uh, Julius. But he's like, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm going to die once. I have to die once anyway. And I'm not going to start missing work thinking today could be the day. That That's admirable. And it's definitely neo-stoicism at, at its finest but it's it's really hard to do it's really hard to do because it requires of a man the confrontation with worst case scenario which which is usually in some um non-adequated death fear some some death theory that you haven't confronted yet so i I agree that if you do ultimately the one way out for the Christian that the the the, the tragics could just say amor feti amor feti amor feti I'm like whatever whatever happens I'm gonna love it it's like okay but that's that's disordered the same way Buddhism is disordered because we have natural appetites for survival we have natural appetites for food water drink our appetites are good Buddhism sucks right Buddhism is nihilism. It's passive nihilism, to borrow the Nietzschean term. It just says, oh, try to make yourself have no desires. Well, that's subhuman. That's like, you know, there's a reason it's Chinese, right? That's that's like robotic. <laughs> so, um, And knockoff. I, I got <laughs> sent out of class as a kid when we were taught about Buddhism. I remember it really clearly. They just explained that there was this Indian prince who went and sat underneath the tree and figured out that everything was emptiness and it was all meaningless. I just laughed so much I got sent out of class. <laughs> <laughs> sounds gay sounds yeah. really indian or something um <laughs> sounds super chinese i mean it's it's not well ordered to not have the appetite for survival and health they're they're absolutely normal just go read aristotle uh, the, the craving of health the, the, the un, unwell man will crave health above all else the poor man will crave money above all else but um the christian can really have this moment where he says, Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And that always is when I take the end run to, okay, what's the worst case scenario here, which I pretty much always do. Cause I always catastrophize and take the end run to the worst case scenario anyway. And it's not about everything. I'm very optimistic. I'm very weird that way. I'm it's only with the worst case scenario in terms of health, everything else. I'm, I'm like, I think this is going to work. I, th I think it's going to work out. I think we're going to, we're going to make it big here. 
but with health, not. Um, that I just end run the end run and I say, okay, Jesus prayer, you know, oldest Christian prayer of this, that's the only thing that ends up making me feel better. And me, me and Nick were talking about it that night out by my basketball hoop. It's like, all right, that's fine. It's what Will said. It's like, if this, if this be it, then this be it. And I can get there as long as I'm not trying to shortcut that step where you're willing to tender it all like, like father Abraham. So, so many, so many thoughts on this touching he, real quick on the, uh, sorry, Will. No, it's the, the point about it ultimately being about confrontation with death. I'm just thinking there's been a lot of times when I was not expecting to almost die when I did almost die one time in a, PE class at a school I was working at the kids were throwing shot put and I went out to pick them up and then I picked the shots up and as I got up everyone's faces were just white with shock and I was thinking what the hell happened and one of them had thrown a shot when he wasn't supposed to show it throw it and uh, it apparently it missed my head like this much just went straight past onto the grass and that would have been it and I was thinking Okay, like in hindsight, I was 100% going to hell at that point. If I died right then, I was in mortal sin for sure. Um, but that wasn't to be. And there's lots of stuff like that. I bet there's times when you're not even aware that you almost died. It might be something, an intersection or plenty of close calls. So just in principle, this idea of worrying that maybe today is the day, maybe it is. I still think that there's a an element of absurdism or irrationality in that that the Seneca approach, I think, is what you were quoting, Will, with, with the stoicism of just figure out what the worst case scenario is, meditate on it, really saturate yourself in it, come to terms with it over and over again, and then transcend it. And in Dune, uh, I, I don't know if you guys seen or read Dune. Anyone? I've seen Frank it. Herbert's tune. Yeah. Uh, great quote from it. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. It's basically exactly what Seneca is, is proposing there. But I'm proposing that there's something additional, something neurotic, irrational that is being perpetuated, that there's that there's some button in the brain or in the heart or in the soul that's being pushed, perhaps by the diabolic, perhaps by an absconding father or a withdrawn mother or something uh, that needs to be resolved in order to because because. Even if it is like hypochondria is kind of the most clear path to, oh, it's the fear of death. I don't find the idea as compelling that all fears lead to the fear of death. Um, because I do, I would argue that what I do in my career flirts with death more than the average Joe, like maybe not like a oil tanker man, but like. Most of the films that I've made, specifically these little ones right here, like the person who made that film 10 years ago, Bill Bowen, he was murdered for it. And the two subjects in that movie were also murdered for, uh, for it. State Senator Nancy Schaefer. Like I, I go out and I do things that put my life on the line all the time. Doesn't bother me whatsoever. But then it's like these abstract things that I, I, I really can't trace that back to a fear of death. So is it is it diabolic? And what do you do with that when you think the rope is a snake and you know the rope isn't a snake, but doesn't matter? I think you got th that's not what's meant in like the Heideggerian sense. It's okay. the confrontation with nothingness, you know, and, and uh, at least material nothingness. So it's not. Yeah, like I I do lots of dangerous things, too. And I have these two two divergent natures i mean i have one nature but i have two divergent sets of mental habits and one is to do particularly when i was younger to do dangerous things and not worry about it and it's like wow those were that was a kind of confrontation with death i mean what's going on between the ears and um confronting like i will again it's not even 
strictly material nothing because I'll road I'll get my heavenly body back at the general judgment but you get it my body will decompose in the earth and um it doesn't matter whether it's going to happen today or it'll be by a car accident probably most of us have had near misses by car accident we don't even know about by the way well but it's well then what okay what's the source of your fear you know sin suffering sickness death all of the the four costs of our first parents um screwing the pooch royally adam and eve sin suffering sickness death what are you really worried about i mean i don't want to go jerry seinfeld but like if the number one public uh fear is 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 public speaking and the number two common fear is is death then it means that like if you're at a funeral you, you think you're better off being the guy in the coffin than the guy that's eulogizing him <laughs> it's an old Seinfeld joke. I it it's kind of dumb for it to be anything other than than that. I mean, the only the only fear that's really rational is fear of winding up in uh eternal damnation. That's a really, really rational fear, and no one can ever really be called hypochondriac for for having it. But um I don't assuming that that's not the fear that any of the four of us are talking about or the anxiety. You guys also never answered whether whether you you go through the um the so-called loop of depression anxiety. I was curious. But I don't I don't know what else can be more valid than like besides that one thing, that one Christian thing. The four last things. Um what is it? Sick death, judgment, heaven, hell. Um yeah, what what's a what's a rational fear to have? It's kind of all hypochondria. And Nick, we even talk about some of your fears is hypochondria. We we talk about uh, a, a type of fear that you and I share, which is to say um, scrupulosity. Think so, sometimes as a as a young kid, thinking I had done things that I hadn't, and being really worried about it, and and telling my mom, I'm like, I know I didn't do this, but I'm worried I did. Well, and it would be something even, like, even like delved into that though, is like, okay, that's there's a difference between inflaming a sin and thinking this is worse than what i had done and ex nihilo fabrication of an event and that's where i'm like okay this is this is getting into weird fringe diabolic or pathological territory where i'm wondering where is the fear of death in that in that like that just seems like its own its own unique thing and and why I keep yeah. bringing this up is when you look at like these TikToks of very mentally unwell people with with the the crazy physical alterations and the surgery and the SSRIs and all these things it's it's very easy to laugh because they are proclaiming to have a, a fear or a difficulty that to us sounds so absurd but, like that's what makes quote unquote mental health this the hardest uh the that's that aspect of mental health i think is the hardest the i'm sad because there's a just reason for it that's not that's just life you know buck up get get a better community around you go find religion practice virtue it's the it's the stuff that makes you feel like you're going crazy that i feel like so with scrupulosity or hypochondria where you can take i mean with scrupulosity, it's you can invent something that you've never done before. And maybe that's even something worse than scrupulosity day. I don't know. But even let's say, for example, you wake up one day and it just it just hits you out of nowhere. What if I have a neurodegenerative disease? And then you can backfill all of this evidence that you might have a neurodegenerative disease. Could that and and I, I've been waiting in the wings with the the screw tape letters here. Could that not be the the demon that was assigned to you at birth, just like you have a guardian angel, just going, hey, what do you think of this? Because they know yeah. you. They know yeah. your idiosyncrasies. And, th and they're just like, you know what? I'm just going to fuck up his whole day. Go deal with this one, buddy. And you just spend the whole day like running around in circles. Like, do I, am I sick? Am I going to die? Yeah, You know, yeah. and I feel like we have to like as Catholics, as Christians, you have to address the fact that there's there's a third entity besides neurochemistry and environment that's that's at play here.
that leverages neurochemistry and environment constantly to drive your attention away from the true, the good, and the beautiful into a form of Satan worship. Ripper would 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 probably agree with me on this that attending to evil and worry and anxiety all the time is a form of worshiping Satan and not Christ. Yeah, there's uh, here's a quote from McHugh and Callan's Moral Theology. The devil who excites vain fears in order to diminish devotion, to discourage the use of prayer and of the sacraments, to drive to tepidity and despair. They put that as the number one external cause of scrupulosity. This is what you're talking about there, Nick. Tepidity wow. and despair. And may making people think that they're not going to go to confession, for example. What a great way that the devil can undermine us. And it, about half an hour ago, when Mike was saying that he's often heard it dismissed as just a chemical imbalance. That framing of the whole problem is the problem because you're not just a collection of chemicals. That's the materialistic view of human beings that is the error of modern psychology. So what Nick's saying here, that we have to appreciate the importance of the spiritual component to human beings and really take seriously the reality of uh, demonic oppression I'm not talking about possession here just oppression that's it that's the catholic view of it right mike absolutely so what i've boiled it down to for me is just simply i'm a guy that has or exercises a lot of control in many many areas of my life right lifting nutrition my sleep hydration etc cetera, etc cetera. extremely disciplined and then it came it comes down to it's the fear of the unknown it's something that i cannot control because when I think about death, it's like death, especially now as a Catholic death, I don't, I'm not scared of death, right? I'm not. It's the fear of this, this imaginary thing and not knowing how to handle it. Mm -hmm. It's not even so much. It's the cancer itself. It's the not having the diagnosis positive. Yeah. Or negative. yeah. Okay. That's question, true. question for that's you, Mike. Good, and I, that's and, a good response. And this is. This is a probing question, so and it's very personal. So answer it only to the degree that you are comfortable. But were there probe alert? Probe alert. <laughs> Trigger warning. Okay. <laughs> were there about relationships? To be <laughs> were there relationships as a child and as in in your formative years that it was your improper responsibility to curate in order to be okay? Did you have to maintain control or exert control over particular emotional states of people in your life to make sure that everything would be okay, that you would be attended to? Yes, early on. And this is, again, I don't, I'm, a, I'm an open book with this stuff, so I don't care about talking about it. But uh, my mother was quite young when she had me. And we went through a particularly she went through a particularly to you know tumultuous and turbulent divorce with my father they tried to get back together and and so there was uh, a bunch of stuff i shouldn't have seen in the home with regards to her behavior toward him and what he demanded of her and so in the light of this divorce and as a young man you know her emotions were kind of all over the place and then in particular with some early relationships with other men there was an instability and in sort of attachment and you know it's insecurity within those relationships so i almost felt like i had to be like a quasi therapist and yes. so i you know what i'm saying so i had to and this was it didn't go on for very long but i do have these i do remember this distinctly um and so i had to show up for her in a way that i probably shouldn't have, should have had to um yeah. and so early on yeah i guess there was definitely some experience with that i haven't given that much thought so i'm kind of trying to like access sure. this memory bank in my brain not that i've blocked it off it's just that there's been so much going on in my life the last 10 15 years i haven't had to mike's gonna wind thought. up crying in a, in the fetal <laughs> position and make, like give me three more questions like, oh. yeah. <laughs> well, in front of will not in front of will it's just a never. single tear if anything never never come on no will will terminate you yeah. you know i I find these sorts of investigations interesting. I also don't know then what like the next step is after you're like, ah, yes, it is that great. Now what? <laughs> like, you know exactly how 
you know the ideology, but like th that doesn't necessarily inform the remedy. It's for me. It's the realization that I'm not as in control as I think that I am. God's and it might provider. it might be like the stoicism like the answer might be some version of stoicism in the end anyway which is just the the recognition that like okay this was the ideology of of my need to to exert control over all situations i understand that that was a result of of something that shouldn't have happened this was trauma this was abuse this was pain of some kind it shouldn't have happened and so therefore my response to it is going to be improper and now that i'm conscious of this i will do my best to relinquish control uh as as it is prudent knowing that i'm exerting control improperly uh and then what you're confronted with is basically exposure response therapy which i think is the only true kind of therapy is yeah. exposure response is this is the only just, kind of therapy you know you don't want to do? Where it's like, it's okay, go walk one. around a cancer ward. You're like, no, I'll do anything. Give me the drugs. Like, I never, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you and know so it works, at that point, you don't want it. it may. And so maybe I just answer my own question that the remedy then is just figuring out what are you afraid of and then sitting with that thing for, okay, so Will was right. All right. And Seneca was right. Circling all but the way back, Will was right. <laughs> I, I think it's important to say this, that um, this is a man-woman difference thing. Like m most young boys, whether from a, a divorced or a non-divorced background, are are um, sired by their their mothers. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're sired by their fathers by definition, but they're they're raised, they're reared by their mothers. And there is a very real difference between men and women where upon men are natural romantics we did a show on that men are national com natural compassionates um not yeah. women uh, yeah. these are these are yeah. two lies we've been told that sea mask is plumbing where are the compassionate and romantic ones and so men who are i think it's i think it's almost a universal com condition nick you're i know what you're asking for between mike and 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 maybe maybe yourself i don't know like, well, you, were you kind of put in a position of emotional nanny to some extent with your mom? I think that is quasi universal. Well, and in the era of absconding you, fathers, you ha that has to be the case. Yeah, it has to. But I mean, but but you you don't you didn't have a, a divorced mom and dad in in the no. era of absconding fathers. It's always going to be true that. Um, to the extent that men aren't acting like patriarchs and, and aren't kind of helping their wives to gain emotional control and to exert some emotional control on their wives. Yeah, this is this is probably universal in the sense that just like, you know, moms are at home raising the sons and I don't I don't want to blame all women, but they there tends to be a primacy of the the, the perceived uh, female problem, which pretty small and it's like hey if your day is going to go all right um junior you know i my day has to be going all right first so it's it's the first instantiation of happy woman happy life mm, and wow. it's not we don't want to blame <laughs> all women we're just getting a little freudian here and um so i i think rather than blame all women it's like I, I, I do think that's the the first place it, it shows up. And at some level, it's just because women are less compassionate than men. And there's a primacy to their problems because they are the weaker sex, the fair sex. And so and they don't tend to others first the way men do. So a young boy with his mom, I love I love my mom. You know, my mom takes care of me in all these other ways. Emotionally, I'll kind of tend to her because one, it'll make me more comfortable anyway. I'll just sublimate whatever's going on. Two, women have this inbuilt response to a, a man who expresses suffering, even if it's their son. Like maybe it's um, overtly the expression of care it depends on the individual woman. But there's always a little bit of that um, attitude. I, I think women are supposed to talk about their sufferings. Men aren't. And it's it's part of the happy woman and happy life thing that gets probably inculcated very young. And I think this is just universal. So I think men, it's really important as a, you said, what to do next to understand that having a community of dudes, I mean, even yeah. for those of us who are very, very, very close with our wives, my wife's my best friend, Will and Mike, your wives are your, your best friends. But this is like 
that area that divides us from the yeah. women, the compassion and empathy thing, women have a really hard time understanding male worry. Cause like, well, you guys are the strong ones. It's like, well, yes, I'm not contradicting that. I would never contradict that. But like, we have shit we have to deal with, like between the ears, between the eyes. Yeah. And, uh, and you need it. You need a group like this to, to be like, okay, did, did you deal with that? Okay. Did you deal with that? We're, we're all having overlap uh, union and intersect on certain issues, but, but among the four of us. So I think that, that's one sort of praxeological takeaway. It's just like, don't, don't blame your mom. Just it's kind of all women. They kind of like, <laughs> don't blame your you mother. Know, blame their problems are bigger women. than everyone else's, <laughs> even if they're smaller, you know, it's really but, interesting because um, if you just look at the psychological studies, women are higher in trait anxiety than men are like anxiety is more often a female thing because they're more risk averse because we don't want women to die because normally when the mother dies, the infant dies. If the father dies, the infant's got a pretty good chance of survival as long as the mother's there. So they are higher in trait anxiety. But the kind of things they worry about are very different from what men worry about. Men tend to have more responsibilities, more dependence, and they're worried about other people's safety a lot more than they are about their own. A lot of the tip, what yeah. Tim was describing to begin with is about you know what will happen to his daughter, for example. Give you a crazy example. I got all oh, my kids had three kittens for Christmas a few years back. And one of the kittens was really sick. I don't even really like cats, but they like it. And I was worried about what was going to happen to this stupid cat with its gastrointestinal disease. I'd wake up like, is the cat dead? And go and have a look <laughs> at it. And it became a thing for me. Even though I didn't like cats, there's just something in my household to look after. Right. And what you see is that I think with young boys being raised as well, when the mother is overly um, influential compared to the father, the mother has this tendency to try and steal the struggle and take away any of the bad yes. stuff the boy might be going through. Whereas what God does is actually just say, you know what? Sometimes the struggle is exactly what you need. And although it might be physically bad for you, this is a harsh truth. A very bad bodily illness, maybe even cancer, might be good for you spiritually. So you just have to accept that there are all kinds of terrible, terrible things that can come your way in the moment will feel like they shouldn't be happening to you, but there's a good reason for that. And you might think, what have I done to deserve this? Like I got cleared by the professional body in the teaching association of any wrongdoing. And for a while I was thinking, this is so unjust. Why have I been fired? And I thought, well, you know what? I, I deserve suffering for all kinds of reasons. It might not be what I did in the lecture that I got fired over, but I've done a lot of bad stuff in my life and I deserve more suffering than this. So I'll just see it that way. And you can take it up a level too, which is the, okay, let's say that you don't think it's for something that you've done in the past, whatever bad thing is happening to you. Well, you can actually offer it up as penance for someone else too. You can think for all the people yeah. who have done something that they deserve to suffer for, I'm going to offer this up for them which again is something you see in, this, in the saints' lives too. So whatever suffering comes your way, the abandonment to divine providence, you can see the value in it either for yourself or for someone else. And you don't have that prideful judgment that you've figured out that there's just no way at all this should ever be happening to you or there's any value in it. That's so right. And I think, I mean, there's so many of these issues that are a byproduct of the absconding father, certainly in my case, um, being raised by a mother who had, had and has, still has great intentions. She's an amazing woman. And I, I love her very much. It's this over identification with emotions and not knowing what to do with them. And it's just a fundamental lack of calibration, not knowing how to handle them. And so that certainly was the case for me and being exposed to her and that maternal instinct that she has was very detrimental to me. So what I did when I was a young man was moved out and moved in with my grandfather, much more of a stoic farmer, Italian, type of man not my issues disappeared because christ was still the missing link in my life but a lot of these these issues with the over identification of emotions um went away went by the wayside so speaking a little bit about um what we've all personally struggled with i know me nick and tim spoke about it. i'd love to hear if the juggernaut himself will nolan has struggled with anything and uh that's that's one question the second bit is what are things that we actively do um, when these things arise or to keep them at bay that have ameliorated these issues. So that's the second part of the question. But uh, Will, how does this present for you, man? I'm I'm morbidly curious myself. Same, <laughs> you know. 
we well, apart from worrying about sick kittens at nighttime the, yeah. the, the the main thing that i've worried about is 100 percent after i was made self-employed after leaving the teaching profession for nearly 20 years and always knowing what money i was earning next month at least that's what i thought i used to imagine that but it turns out for anybody who imagines uh, being employed is a is a safety net. It's not. The sort of Damocles is there over your head the entire time. I understand that now. But psychologically, it just felt comfortable thinking, oh, I earn X amount per year, and this amount's coming in next month. When that went, I spent a lot of time obsessing about where the next paycheck was coming from because my expenses are super high with seven kids, stay-at-home wife, all the rest of it. So that was the worst kind of anxiety, I think, that I can um, draw a parallel to between what you guys are saying. It's not so much about my own health, but the fixation on it, the the irrationality of thinking that what if something bad happens? What can I do to control it and make sure that doesn't happen? That became a big focus for me. And the way I got around it was just thinking, okay, well, let's say that next month no work comes my way. Providence has put that before me and there'll be some reason for that. Maybe it's so that I pray more or become more humble, whatever it might be. There's a reason for that situation. And I also trust that it won't get so bad that it will mean that I totally lose the ability to provide for my family. Maybe we have to become more frugal and that could be a really good thing. So try to look on the bright side of whatever God sends your way. And looking back on some of those years when I was convinced that you know, the next month I wouldn't be able to pay the bill for the housing or whatever it was. It never happened. It always worked out fine. And I actually learned a lot going through it. So I think that's the main thing I would point to. I'm trying to think of other things that have really bothered me. Um, one time when I was a kid, my middle brother grabbed a pot of treacle, like golden syrup, and he just thought, I'm going to drink that. And he poured it down his throat and it was kind of cold and sticky. It got stuck in his throat and he started choking. And I was really young at the time, couldn't figure out what to do. My mom couldn't figure out what to do either. So we had this choking kid in the middle of the kitchen with a esophagus full of treacle and couldn't get any air in. And a friend who was there at the time figured out, let's just pour some really hot water down his throat. And it melted it. And then he could breathe again. But since that time of feeling like I had nothing I could do in that moment to fix it, I got anxious about people choking and that stayed with me with my own kids when they're toddlers as well, first learning to have solids. I was thinking, you know, what, what if they choke? So it's like, well, if they do, then I'll just have to go through the procedure and then hopefully that's going to resolve it. So that's more similar to some of the health concerns that you mentioned. But it's all about um, letting go and accepting that there are some things that you can't control. And that's just a position that hurts your own pride sometimes. I thought we were about to hear a, a Will Nolan irrational treacle fear. I was like, <laughs> Anytime treacle's nearby, Will's beetle positioning up. Yeah, no, the, by the way, young men out there, once you start having little kids who begin feeding themselves at three or whatever, toddler age kids, it's not an irrational fear to be worried about choking because they just choke all the time and it's terrifying. It's so terrifying, isn't it? Um, yeah. Well, your fears are so rational. I will say, as I approach the four year anniversary, June the 3rd, of finding out I was fired, that was one I just, again, I don't catastrophize. It, it's it's so interesting to to note the polymorphism of of our, our four fears here. There's some overlap, there's some not. I'm like, I somehow just knew things were going to be okay. And the last four years have been, they've just flown by in uh, self employed entrepreneurship. So I, I and, and I know they have for you too, Will, but it's such a rational fear. But that one I never had. I'm like, no, no, no. I prefer to worry about stuff that's never going to happen so much better. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's odd. It's odd to see how how um, fear meets each man uh, between the ears, between the eyes, in the heart. Yeah, so the, the way, the two main ways have been health worry um financial worry and and so this is a, a message to all the young people out there too there was many times in my youth when i always thought i was depressed um when really i was just going through a, a breakup or i was fornicating too much 
Like a breakup's not depression, guys. The Zoomers need to hear this. Like you're not depressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just make that clear. How many times I thought it was depressed? It's like, no, it's because I had sex before marriage. I formed a bond with a woman I shouldn't have formed a bond before marriage with. And yeah. that's the result of we're not meant to break up, guys. That's not what we're meant to do with these people right. that we end up having sex with. It's a like very, that. very, very important thing to say. A lot of people don't understand that. I think it's exacerbated by this fornicating, porn-watching culture. It is, because right. you're playing house. So it is like yes, a it. divorce. If you've had exactly. sex or Death. gone anywhere near yeah. home run, if you've gone to even really second or third, second base with a girl on the old you know, 90s base system, then that is like a divorce because you're not supposed to be doing that. On, on the other yeah. hand, you don't get emo music or even the blue Weezer record level of angst post breakup <laughs> from going and sitting in a drawing room with uh, two or three or four different girls and their their like aunties, you know, which is the way you're supposed to really court girls, but just yeah. find out about them, learn them learn who they are you don't get that if you you're like oh that girl's boring i i didn't like her i didn't like the way that girl's nose wheezed when she talked like i don't like her you're not going to get the angst you mike's dead right you only get the angst from pretending you're some girl's husband for one two three years i don't think it's really spoken about enough will go ahead no it's not um in his 800 and something page textbook introduction to the science of mental health father ripica makes the point about cohabitation that it leads to mental problems because you are in a situation where you lack the grace that you get from the sacrament of marriage and that means that you are exposing yourselves to the flawed reality of fallen human nature but you're not being given god's help to actually cope with that so mm, right. it's bad for both of you. And that's why it works out basically never. So mm. you need extra help to be able to cope with your, your own vices, your spouse's vices. Marriage is tough in that way. Yes, you are the your spouse's sucker, like spiritual aid, but you're also each other's cross in a sense too. And you, you wear away each other's rough edges and God makes that so it turns out okay and you can't do it without his grace. So cohabitation is itself a kind of, occasion for for mental illness fornication is also a mental illness like you, you got to mm -hmm. be blunt about that fact sin makes you stupid father ripperger said that as well yeah, and nick. so go ahead nick it, it darkens the intellect and if we're if we're speaking about mental health and the capacity of right reason um I, for catholics uh, it would make sense before any medication is considered any cold shower, black coffee, journaling, fasted cardio, David Goggins podcast, listening, um, go six months without habitual mortal sin. Go to confession once or twice a month. Receive the Eucharist every single Sunday in a state of grace. So go right beforehand if you have to, and, uh, to confession that is. And try praying the rosary at least once a day once every other day um it's takes 17 minutes there is no excuse for any catholic who hasn't who's who's saying i've tried everything and hasn't tried the rosary it's like it's literally 17 minutes i've timed it yeah i've timed it and there i have a book over here i haven't read it it's the liber christo method um which uh ripperger partnered with some guy and um I personally, this isn't taking shots at the rosary. This is taking shots at how Catholics, especially like Chad Catholics, treat the rosary. Like, it's a weapon. Every Hail Mary is a bullet fired at Satan. And <laughs> and I, I, I don't like, I don't like this conception of the rosary. Um, anybody who has had any peripheral contact with the diabolic in any way knows that Prayer is not a binary effective strategy. The exorcism, the exorcism of Emily Rose is based on a woman named Annalise Michelle who had 67 solemn rite bishop appointed exorcisms. 67. Those are between one and four hour long sessions 
with all of the smells and bells and all of the power of Holy Mother Church behind them. And it took 67. So this idea that you're just going to pray and you're going to feel better right afterward is nonsense. And if you look at prayer like that, like you're going to just get bitter at God. So I'm not saying if you pray the rosary every day, you're going to have like a fantastic mental health life. But we are talking about spiritual warfare peripherally. I do think we there's so much more to discuss on the subject. And if you're leaving the rosary aside or something equivalent, though, I would say that that's probably number one up there. Um, you are leaving a lot on the table. So to talk about some effective strategies, just real quick, to to, to for people to understand the severity, uh, I went through a period, a long period of like alcoholism. I abused drugs, all kinds of drugs. I was a fornicator. I ended up in like one level below the psych ward when I was in my early 20s, have been through tons of talk therapy, uh, flirted with suicide for much of my life, mixed pills and alcohol quite often, especially during COVID. I was drinking like three, four bottles of like, uh, uh, 101 proof whiskey per week. It was bad. And I was still fun. I don't know how I was still functioning. Um, you look great. <laughs> the Italian, it's the olive oil, dude. Um, that how you deadlift 800. Yeah. yeah what the still, hell? This is like terrible. I was still somehow doing it. I was still somehow hitting PR advice for process. everybody. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, dude. I've Does been that to mean the you could be deadlifting sixteen hundred pounds if you hadn't done that? <laughs> That's what I like to say. I'm not deadlifting a thousand pounds because of all the wild turkey one hundred and one I was I, I drank <laughs> in my twenties. Uh, so just to, so people understand the depths of it, it's been really bad for much of my life as a young boy. I remember going through this stuff, um, and struggled with with it for much of my time as a Protestant. Okay, so what I can say is obviously it's mental, physical, spiritual. That's we're comprised of those three things as human beings. So on the physical side, obviously lifting weights, eating well, incredibly important. Mentally, uh, sleeping well, incredibly important. These things have helped to a certain degree. The rest of it was effectively combated by a, um, a beautiful prayer life and faith walk that I've only begun to experience in the last six months coming back to the Catholic church. I don't mean to sound like um, this guy that's full of zeal and, 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 you know, piss and vinegar, so to speak, but I have to speak to it because that's the, I'm, it's, it's a true witness of my faith and testimony that praying the rosary daily upon waking. And then before I go to bed, staying in some type of prayer or conversation with God throughout the day, I don't listen to secular music anymore. I don't listen to secular podcasts anymore. I'm only consuming stuff about the faith. Jesus is like front of mind all day. Um, So we have to understand that there's a spiritual component of warfare that I think we're completely blinded to. The Deliverance Prayers book by Father Ripperger has been very effective as well. I pray it every night with my family. It's right over there. Yeah, it's it's under, it's uh, two books above the case for patriarchy. Must have. Oh, there you go. (laughs) There you go. Uh, and so reading that every night Move over the my case family, for patriarchy up, you, you have to, <laughs> and don't forget, to ask your husband as well. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, of course. And then, so father Ripperger's book, praying the rosary, uh, having a fulfilled, beautiful prayer life, praying with my family, attending mass, um, con- confession and the Eucharist by themselves, all those things in combination in these last couple of months of experiencing this, it's not to say that things might change and I don't know, maybe the devil will ramp up his attacks. I don't know. This anxiety, this stress, this depression, this worry, all this stuff that I've been through, gone. Not just that, playing the Gregorian chant in the background, we know it's a demonic irritant, right? Mm -hmm. Father Ripperger also talks about this too. And so it's like, it's not just enough to be a barbell bro. It's not just enough to be (laughs) a soul bra and get all the supplements and, and, and sleep and, uh, 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 sun tanning your uh, uh, sphincter or testicles or whatever they do. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's also it's like we cannot neglect the spiritual component. And for me, that was the most powerful because I had the other things down. They still didn't do much. They didn't. They weren't able. They they it, those things were not enough for me to withstand the temptation of alcohol. Since returning, reverting to the faith, the craving for alcohol is gone. I gave it up in penance to the Lord, especially on Fridays. I don't even want it. I don't even want it completely sober minded. And with all of these things in combination, the spiritual realm, it's like these things are, are, are just now your results may vary. 
right? I'm, <laughs> right, obviously. In the case of the exorcism of the em of Emily Rose, like clearly, like she should have just lifted more weights, bro. She should have just deadlifted. What's wrong with her, man? But what I can say is a guy that's been through it um, and have come back to the faith and have established this powerful prayer life. Um, these these things are gone, or at least affected. Like you, you neglected to mention the best benefit of daily rosary which is i yada 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 you you'll go to heaven yada 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 it'll help you get virtue but you you neglected in the number one thing that you so are you get on to taylor tell. marshall's team you're uh, on taylor marshall's that's true team. you're on taylor marshall's team i thought you were going to yeah. say that you get to say that you pray the rosary yeah that, well that, that's <laughs> that's the same same difference right? i <laughs> think you get like 10x the graces if you pray the rosary and never tell anyone I yeah. don't know. I'll never know. I'll never know. I'm not humble enough to do that. But yeah. <laughs> you know what I do daily and whose team that puts me on? I'll let you guess. Is there an inside uh, joke that I'm missing here? There's like some. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. You look, I was, I'm looking at only you because of my monitor and I'm like, Mike's not right. getting this. Joke. Yeah. Well, on yeah. TNT, he, uh, right, right I don't know if show, he still yeah. says it, but uh, I, I really wouldn't know, but he would say, pray the, pray the rosary daily or you're not on the team. And I was like, I, oh, oh. I, could I object that? That's just, that's not true. Yeah, it's definitely you can, not If true. the team is Catholic, you don't, it's not like a, a precept of the faith. So, And Tim and I, I mean, there? we've yeah. privately, and I don't know if we talked about this on the, the show much, um, prayer is, is, is an individual thing. And it's not like, I don't like protocols and I don't like people saying that like, you have to do this protocol or you're a bad Catholic or you will suffer in a particular way. That's not true. It's not true. It's just for the, it's like for the guys who message me and they're like, I'm addicted to porn. Can you pray for me? It's like, well, are you, are you praying rosary every day? No. Well then like, good luck. There's, mm -hmm. I mean, Peterson, um, on Fred was, was just on Fred and, um, he said something that uh, is sounds like it's straight out of This Is How by Augustine Burroughs, my second favorite book of all time, which he's like, there's not, um, you don't stop an addiction by stopping it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just nonsense. Because then what are you going to do? What are you going to do in the meantime there? So I, I won't get into the whole addiction thing, but um, yeah, ros rosary is worthwhile for people who are, um, trying to engage more seriously. And if that's not what you're being called to in your prayer life at the time, that's, I'm not saying that you have to, or you're a bad Catholic if you don't at all. No, um, I also wasn't like trying to be the heavy Mike. I was just trying to make you laugh. <laughs> no, 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 I was like, <laughs> no, oh, he's no, not no. getting the joke. Okay. No, no, no. I, I, I'm aware of Taylor Marshall. I wasn't, wasn't aware of the joke. And, and yeah. I, I agree, Nick, like protocols can be, cause you can't just be prescriptive for everybody with the same thing. It's like, this is why with my content, I'm not preaching at people to do a certain thing. It's like, this is what's, this is what's working for this guy right here. You could yeah, try right. it. Yeah. You probably, yeah. you didn't it. sound preachy at all. You didn't. Oh, I hope, preachy. I hope not, man. I hope not. No, you sounded good. It just sounded like, Hey, this is what I did that worked for me. God is good. Deo gratias, you know, yeah. but no, my, then my joke made it. It's just dumb. Anyway. There's a, um, <laughs> there's a, a spiritual You're classic right. book called The Abandonment to Divine Providence by Jean-Pierre de Cossard. I think it's 17th century. I'd really recommend that anyone who's struggled with some of the stuff that we talked about today, have a look at that. Because if you want something that's really stood the test of centuries of readers and everyone saying this has helped, that's a book to turn to. Here's a couple of lines from it that sum up what we've been saying. There's not a moment in which God does not present himself under the cover of some pain to be endured, of some consolation to be enjoyed, or of some duty to be performed. All that takes place within us, around us, or through us contains and conceals his divine action. God teaches the soul by pains and obstacles, not by ideas. And there's one other one that I think just sums up today perfectly. To escape the distress caused by regret for the past or fear about the future, this is the rule to follow. Leave the past to the infinite mercy of God, the future to his good providence. Give the present wholly to his love by being faithful to his grace. So wow. that sums up quite wow. a few of the different lines of thought we've been yeah. considering in today's episode. And that's abandonment to divine providence. This is why it's so great being Catholic because you've got this unequaled, 
like nothing even comes close tradition of spiritual wisdom, philosophical insight, and you just go and you mine it and it will help you. I, I want to speak to a couple of things on that, Will. Um, the present. Uh, so screw tape letters, just I, I recently read it. I know this is from the 30s. So like um, not breaking new ground by pointing out this this book. And I'm sure that the book that you re referenced, Will, is more erudite than than this work of fiction but for um for the for the lowbrow kid who needs audiobooks and pictures this has been very effective at transmitting a lot of those truths that you just described and um he talks about the present as the domain of god and the past and the future as the domain of satan and uh, that because god's outside of time contemplation of heaven and contem and and remaining present is the two ways in which man are closest to God. And if he wants to spend as much time away from God as possible, put him in the, in the past or the future. Um, and so I wanted to speak on the idea of fear for a second, a few, few notes that I took on this first was what Ripperger says that fear is, which is the perception of a future evil that you cannot overcome. And as soon as I heard him say that, I wrote that down. The perception of a future evil that you cannot overcome. And so something that I was thinking about in prep for this episode is if we were, if all of us were to zoom out and look at the fears or the, the, the time that we've dedicated to fears and what those particular fears are and express as a percentage how many of those fears came true in the way that we were afraid of them. When expressed as a percentage, it would probably be zero. At least in my case, it is. <laughs> so uh, something that I learned, maybe one day I'll explain more as to how, but something that I learned um, about nine months ago was that the language of demons is fear and the language of God is faith. And I, I know that kind of just sounds like Christian word salad, but I, I do mean that very specifically. So faith, to quote Hebrews, is the evidence, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. Okay. So faith is substance and evidence, which is not how the word faith was ever used in my entire life. Faith was the thing that was filled in like dark energy is in astrophysics equations because the math didn't work. Like, well, I know you're supposed to be over there. I know you can't get there. So just throw faith in there and now you're supposed to be there. Congratulations. You believe in God or you you assent to whatever these truths are. But that's not what faith is. It's substance and it's evidence. And it's a gift as well. And it's also an act. It's an act of faith. Weirdly enough, Fear is the exact same thing, just inverted. Mm -hmm. It has no substance and there is no evidence, but it produces like a very real result. You might even say that it, for most people, fear produces more of a visceral, actual affectation of behavior than faith does. I would say most people do, unless unless you're surrounding yourself with saints. Most people are acting very reliably in accordance with what they're afraid of and not faith, even though there's, as we just said, there's been zero out of all of the times that whatever you're afraid of has transpired in the way that you think. So again, going back to what Will was saying, the the past and the future are the domains of Satan. And so I've been I've been waiting to read this, but in terms of what a man can do to deal with fears like this. So for those who don't know, Screwtape uh, is a demon. He's writing to his nephew, Wormwood, and uh, it's from the perspective of demons and uh, trying to coach his nephew, Wormwood, into best dragging his patient to hell. And so... Um, he says, and now for your blunders on your own, showing you first of all, allowed the patient to read a book he really enjoyed because he enjoyed it and not in order to make clever remarks about it to his new friends. In the second place, you allowed him to walk down to the old mill and have tea there, a walk through country he really likes and taken alone. In other words, you allowed him two real positive pleasures. 
were you so ignorant as to not see the danger of this? The characteristic of pains and pleasures is that they are unmistakably real, and therefore, as far as they go, give the man who feels them a touchstone of reality. Thus, if you had been trying to damn your man by the romantic method, by making him a kind of child herald or worther submerged in self-pity for imaginary distresses, you would try to protect him at all costs from any real pain, because, of course, five minutes' genuine toothache would reveal the romantic sorrows for the nonsense they were and unmask your whole stratagem. But you were trying to damn your patient by the world. That is, by palming off vanity, bustle, irony, and expensive tedium as pleasures. How can you have failed to see that a real pleasure was the last thing you ought to let him meet? Didn't you foresee that you that it would just kill, by contrast, all the trumpery which you have been so laboriously teaching him to value, and that sort of pleasure which the book and the walk gave him was the most dangerous of all? that it would peel off from his sensibility the kind of crust you have been forming on it and make him feel that he was coming home, recovering himself. As a preliminary to detaching him from the enemy, you want to detach him from himself and had made some progress in doing so. Now all that is undone. And the the rest of this particular letter is about how, and this is why the East and Buddhism is so gay, like God made pleasures. They are secondary goods which which orient us toward actual goods. And so positive moral pleasures are, I think, one of the best ways to draw the man right back into reality and just sort of awaken him to the present. And it's it's so abundantly clear what fear is designed to do. It's like you you become anhedonic. <laughs> Going back to the SSRI thing, it's like you can't feel pleasure. You're not hungry. I don't know about you guys. When I get anxious and afraid, I can't fucking eat. I cannot eat. I'm throwing up all the time. My appetite goes. I'm skipping songs on Spotify like crazy. Like no song sounds good. You don't want to commune with friends. I mean, like the amount of times I've gone over Tim's house and it's it's brought me out of a of a stupor of some kind. But even getting there, I'm like, I'd rather just kind of sit at home. Why? I don't know, because it's more comfortable to just be like home and not feel good than to just get out and go commune with friends like that. So I guess something I only just recently read this so I, I can't even say it's something that I'm doing but something that I'm going to be striving to do going forward is just very consciously like cataloging what are positive moral pleasures and then just do them as much as humanly possible mm -hmm. the, the other thing I was thinking Nick as you're describing that idea of fear and unreality is that accounts for a lot but if you look at Christ in the garden of Gethsemane when he's sweating blood and he really is afraid about what's coming and it is exactly as he knows it's going to be. It's <laughs> yeah. not an unreal fear. He still yeah. goes ahead with it. He's afraid yeah. of it, but he goes ahead with it because it's what his mission is, what he has to do. So there's that case as well. So the, the thing that you're afraid of happens and you still go through with it anyway. And that accounts for the other element in life when we're afraid sometimes it's irrational and it never happens sometimes it does and that's okay too but i think there's a difference in um in what happens in a man and what at least what i've experienced i'm curious if you guys have experienced this as well the the garden of gethsemane is electrifying it's really beautiful to to especially in the passion of the christ the film um and I feel like I've been there in various stages of my life where like you're 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 almost hypoxic like you feel like pins and needles cuz you're so afraid and you know what you have to do and it's like the scariest thing you've ever done. But there's a difference between the clarity my English teacher used to say knowledge is tied to culpability. Like the moment you know that you're supposed to do something it's okay to be afraid because you're just like, all right, well, I have to somehow muster up the courage to go and do that thing. 
and so like the fear is 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 almost edifying because you're it's courage isn't just being afraid it's being afraid of the right things and then doing and taking right action in the face of that and so as a man like being called to courage feels good and i think the reason why satan keeps us being afraid of non-rational things is because it's just it, you're just spinning there's no actual direction there's no edification whatsoever so it's like we'll just keep you afraid of something that's never going to happen the hypochondria the scrupulosity the past the future um versus what christ was doing which is like that is probably the greatest act of courage ever it has to be of course like taking on the sins of the entire world and suffering the most gruesome death. I, I I don't know that there, by definition, could be a more courageous act. But like, there's no courage of being afraid of something that's irrational and wrong, and then just worrying about it for a long period of time, which is basically what I do <laughs> a lot of time. It may not sound very rational, <laughs> but when I'm in those moments, I try to keep telling myself that I'm not an atheist. So why should I have anxiety? There's hope. I'm supposed to have hope. Like I'm not supposed to be an anxiety. It's such a simplistic quote and it's kind of stupid, but anxiety being like atheism in motion. They're like, yeah, it's kind of dumb, but it's something that I kind of, I play out in my head. It's like, I only know hope because I believe in hope in Jesus Christ. And that's it. And it's like, how many times does be not afraid show up in the Bible? You know, many, 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 many times. And so if we look at these 365, <laughs> actually. Is it actually one, 365? Yeah, one for every day. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, that 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 sort of says enough. And so the one thing that I just try to tell myself when I'm getting into this, you know, uh, hypochondria or whatever, don't feed the beast. Don't go to Google. Don't sit there and ruminate in my thoughts. Pray. Read the word. If you're in despair, read the Psalms. Doing something that is orienting yourself to Christ versus orienting yourself inward to yourself. That's where the enemy wants you. He wants you to be oh, like anywhere you. but WebMD. <laughs> read, <laughs> yeah. read comic books. Yeah, read, don't just don't do it, man. <laughs> read the back of your vomit bag on your next yeah. flight. You read old yellowed newspapers from Hoboken. Do not read WebMD because <laughs> you will be convinced you have cancer. There's a special yeah. disorder that only med students get, isn't there, where they think they've got everything they're studying about. There's a special yeah. name for it. I can't remember it. I have got... that, and I was never... <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're not med <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Med students and Tim and Mike. <laughs> yeah. I've got a lesson coming up now, guys. I've got to go, and I'm the host. But it's been really good speaking with you, as always. And this has been a really rich episode. I'm going to re-listen to it. Really good. We love you, you Will. God bless you, dudes. Love Take you. care. Okay, guys. We... Looking forward yeah, to next God time. Bless.